Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Arturo Oliveira, and I am on the Talks at Google team. I am very excited to welcome to Google today the great actor and comedian, Rain Wilson. He's here to talk about his new memoir, The Bassoon King, My Life in Art, Faith, and Idiocy. Now, we all know Rain as the lovable Dwight Schrute from NBC's The Office. But the thing is that through The Bassoon King, Rain really lets us know who he really is and what his career has been like. So with that, I would love to welcome up Rain Wilson. Thanks, Arthur. Hello. Thank you very much for coming to Google. Hey, thanks for having me. I love it. I love it here. This yeah. is great. Got a great Free food. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we're very happy that you're here. Uh, I, like, like I said in the intro, we all love The Office, but I think what I especially loved about the, the Bassoon King is really getting to know your life story. And what was really interesting to me, what I wanted to start off with, is it's easy for us to see people who are famous and think that they just did it, right? They snapped their fingers and they got on a TV show, they got in a movie, whatever it is, but you talk so much about the ups and downs of your career. What made you want to be, make yourself so vulnerable with the audience? Well, I, uh, I did research and I had read a lot of celebrity memoirs when I was getting ready to, to write this because I wanted to see what worked and what didn't. And one of the things that I thought did not work was memoirs where I read and I didn't know the person at the end of the memoir any more than I did at the beginning. What I responded to, me, to personally were, were the... Um, the heartfelt stories, um, the vulnerabilities, the struggles, the ups and downs, the roller coaster ride that the person went on. And those are the things that I could relate to and kind of learn from. And, and I also found them to be the funniest because they, they just they struck a, a nerve, you know, they, they struck a deeper chord. So uh, I, I, I swung for the fences. I really was like, you know, I want this, I'm going to write one, you know, and this, I want to. This is who I am, and this is what I'm about. And uh, if I walk out here and, and uh, on Charleston and get hit by a bus, and this is the document that it's at everything. It's all my failures and struggles. And uh, I get hit by the Google bus. No one will even no one will even look up from their Wi-Fi computers and be like, um. oh, uh, that would be very tragic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> got to be someone here who, you know, runs the buses or just kind of panicking in the back of the room somewhere. But if I was hit by a Google car, it would be going seven miles an hour. <laughs> so it just like, I'd probably knock the car over. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for explaining that. Is, is that also, does that also tie into why you decided to write it now? Why not 20 years from now? Uh, well, there was a window of time, and it just seemed like the, the right uh, opportunity. I finished The Office, and right away I shot a pilot uh, for the show Backstrom that ran on Fox for a little while before it was canceled. One person whistled. <laughs> <laughs> one person groaned, because no one watched it. Um, and then uh, I had this nice chunk of time, and I thought, well, this is a time to do it. I had actually, I was here at Google uh, like maybe five years ago, where we read from our... Um, Soul Pancake book, Soul Pancake Chew on Life's Big Questions. And um, when I wrote the introduction to that book, I saw that there was a story there that I really wanted to tell. Um, there's, yeah, there's the funny stories of worms coming out of my butt in Nicaragua and being a starving <laughs> actor and broke and struggling and trying to make my way in LA and being a nerd in high school. Those are all, I know there's a lot of funny stories, but there's also a through line of my kind of spiritual and artistic journey that I thought this, that made it a book and not just a collection of funny anecdotes. And absolutely, it's a very cohesive story from beginning to end and, and we can see your growth as a person and as an actor throughout the book, which is why I'm so excited for everyone to, to be able to read it. Uh, so now taking a step back, I think we're all wondering about the name. Why the Bassoon King? Well, um, the bassoon was a, um, I played the bassoon for five years in junior high and high school. Do you it's still kinda, play 
Uh, I, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I can't, I dug one out about five or six days ago because I had to play it on the Colbert Show. I hadn't played a bassoon in 30 years. <laughs> um, but uh, I have a little section here. I'm going to, um, I'm going to read uh, about the bassoon and about being nerdy in high school. Maybe a few of you can relate. <laughs> a couple, one or two of you might be able to relate just a teeny, teeny little bit. All right, ready, children? <laughs> I ask you to savor the following sentence. For several years, off and on, I was a member of the following clubs at school. Marching band, pep band, orchestra, debate club, computer club, chess club, model United Nations, and pottery club. <laughs> Note, the above list does not include my aforementioned role-playing gaming, Baha'i youth activities, medieval weapons sketching, kung fu movie obsession, or vast Columbia Record and Tape Club cassette collection featuring Journey Sticks Asia and REO Speedwagon. And then, if that wasn't enough, I decided to play the bassoon. Boom, universe explodes, then implodes, then explodes again, quickly folding in on itself, only to create infinite other bassoon-shaped universes. <laughs> Let's dig a little deeper, shall we? Having studied piano as a kid and then clarinet at Kellogg Middle School, I went to my band teacher and told him I wanted to quit clarinet and play tenor sax. Saxophone was way cooler, you see. Guys in the sax section would crack jokes and wear sunglasses in class sometimes. Clarinet wasn't pathetically loserish. I mean, it wasn't French horn. <laughs> but it certainly wasn't the most masculine of instruments. Sure, there was a clarinet-like instrument in the cantina scene in Star Wars. But let's face it, clarinets are for girls and braces and Woody Allen, who loves girls and braces. Ba boom boom. <laughs> My band teacher, John Law, real name, really pulled a fast one on me. He said something to the effect of, well, you could play the sax, but we've got so many saxophones right now. Wait a minute. He paused for dramatic effect and lowered his voice conspiratorially. You know what's really cool and unique? And I was like, what? What's really cool and unique? And he was like, the bassoon. And I was like, wow, what's that? And with that ridiculous manipulation, a bassoonist was born. The bassoon is absurd. They should be banned for being horrible, unnecessary, and adenoidally grating. It takes like an hour to assemble one. They're enormous and are made out of Lincoln logs, aluminum twigs, and paper towel tubes. There are these tiny double wooden reeds that you have to soak and trim and tend to all the time. There's a strap that you actually have to sit on when you play so the whole thing doesn't fall onto the floor like a bundle of garbage. Uh, and after all that, falderall, it ends up sounding like an anemic donkey with laryngitis. I ended up playing the bassoon for the next five years until I graduated high school. For better or worse, I spent my adolescence tethered to that bastard woodwind, my siren, my spirit animal, my nerd crucifix. <laughs> Bravo. All right. Bravo. Yes. No, really. No, really. I'm confident you just transported everyone here back to middle school. Back. A little bit. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think the title of the book is, uh, it's, in and of itself, it's a microcosm of the book because you have the Bassoon King, a fun title, but you also have the subtitle, My Life and Art, Faith and Idiocy. And mm -hmm. Uh, I really like how in the, in the beginning, in the special things section, you thank your dad for teaching you about art and faith. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about your dad and the relationship you had with him uh, growing up? Because you, talk, you have so many beautiful anecdotes to share about your relationship with him and the influence he had on you. Yeah, so um, w I talked about the faith aspect of it, which is a little bit risky, too, because people don't really talk about faith. Uh, or they don't do it in a way that's funny and a little bit edgy, like I'm trying to. But um, I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith, and my dad was a Baha'i. And um, his, the way he wove his spiritual belief in, and his creativity together were really inspiring. So my dad was an aspiring painter. Um, he paints abstract oil paintings, and they were always in our house stacked to the ceiling and hung on all the walls, and, and then he'd swap them out every once in a while. He wasn't very good at selling them, but he was really good at, at painting them. And he also wrote um, tons of science fiction and fantasy novels while I was growing up. So uh, he worked as a, uh, 
uh, in a sewer contracting office in Seattle, but he would pound away on a little manual typewriter when he wasn't answering phones or doing billing or, you know, sewer truck dispatching. He would write, he wrote like 10 or 12 fantasy and science fiction novels. So that was very inspiring. He always encouraged me to be creative and extend my imagination. Um, and he was a very devoted member of the Baha'i faith and um, was always trying to kind of deepen his spirituality at the same time. So those are some things I'm, I'm really grateful for. Um, it was also, you know, on the, on the more negative side, it was also the fact that he was kind of a failed artist, that he, he wasn't able to achieve his dream as an artist. He was supporting the family and working day jobs and stuff, so he didn't get to really pursue it. That also helped me to become an actor because I saw what could happen to someone who wanted to be an artist but wasn't able to or willing to commit completely into that world. And I knew, so when I made that decision to become an actor, I, it was a very serious decision. I knew that I was going to be needing to commit 10 years of my life at least to intensive training and studying with the very best people and calling myself an actor and really pursuing that dream and committing whole hog. You can't just do it on the side. So in a way he was, um, he also showed me what not to do if you wanted to be an artist. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love that. that um that journey and how he helped you really make the decision to go to NYU to really invest in, in that, mm -hmm. that part of, of who you wanted to be. Uh, and I, I also wanted to ask, I think, as far as the next generation, you talk a lot about uh, how nerdy you were mm -hmm. growing up, and you played Dungeons and Dragons, and you read fantasy and science fiction. Is your son uh, following in your, your nerdy footsteps? Well, that's funny. He's, he's 11 years old, Walter, and um, it's, it's such a different landscape then to now. So when I was a nerd in the late 70s and early 80s, it was uh, a very different place. <laughs> there were no nerd television shows and nerd CEOs and there was no Silicon Valley and there was, uh, there was no Bill Gates, there was no Beck, you know, there was no, there was <laughs> nerd rock stars, you know, there, it, this, it, it didn't exist. You were, you were really the lowest on the totem pole. And, and in, even I remember even the teachers would get in on it. I mean, even if there was no concept of like stopping bullying. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> bullying is good for you. I mean, it, it toughens you up. It gives you wisdom and it, you know, it lets you grow. It was, a, it was a positive thing. And so teachers growing up, I remember like some kid with zits in the corner was, did something stupid and, you know, picked his nose or something, and the teacher's like, yeah, you should kick the crap out of him. You picked his nose in class. I hope you do. Anyway, turn your pages to, you know what I mean? It was, it was yeah. a much, it was a very different uh, world. Uh, and nerds were reviled, and, um, and it, it just was a matter, of course, like you're gonna get punched and you're gonna get made fun of, and that's just how it is. It's, a, it's different now. So my son is in school, and he's, you know, he does it all. So he plays Dungeons and Dragons with his friends on the weekend, hmm. and then he's on the flag football team, you know. And it's and there's not there doesn't seem to be like any kind of issue with that. Um, he's really geeks out about science fiction movies and stuff like that, and uh, and music. And at the same time, he's well liked. So uh, I think it's a better time, by and large. Better way to grow up. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you, you talk a lot, you, you go on, respectfully, a little bit of a rant in the book about how being geeky and nerdy is now considered cool. You mentioned the nerdy CEOs and uh, TV shows, Silicon Valley and, and everything. What do, you think is, what do you think has caused that cultural shift? Is it the importance of technology and, and these things in society? Is it just purely money and marketing or? Yeah, I think. It, there's a lot of different factors. I mean, a couple is you know, we went from a, a manufacturing-based economy to an information-based economy. You know, over the course of 20 years, in, in less than one generation. Um, and uh, I also think that capitalism is king, and the capitalists swiftly realize, like, hey, wait a minute, these nerds are making some money and they'll spend that money and they'll tell their friends to spend that money on movies and on you know on gadgets and everything so let's 
you know, they used to kind of be shunned, mm -hmm. but let's, let's co-opt them. So the whole nerd geek kind of thing is kind of overly talked about. And, um, but a, a lot of it just has to do with, like, how can we suck the nerds dry of their cash? <laughs> do, do you still play D&D? I don't play D and D anymore. No, I just I don't have the time. I would love to. Hmm. I, w I would love to. I mean, there's nothing against it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, I I think I think the the great thing about hearing you talk about that at Google is the fact that for the most part, almost all of us in this room were on a similar boat, and to a certain to greater or lesser degree while growing up. And it's, it's great to be able to identify with someone who kind of had that same experience. Mm -hmm. And as you said, kind of climbed the ladder of nerddom in high school until you made it to theater and you were at the top of that. that yeah, ladder. I call the theater geeks um, the lions of the nerd Serengeti. Um, <laughs> the, the theater, because theater's at the top because there are actually cute girls in the theater <laughs> who, if you make them laugh enough, they will potentially make out with you. <laughs> so. Uh, I once I um, went I transferred high schools from Seattle to Chicago and they had a good theater department there and I and I did this I have a chapter called how Elvis Costello made me an actor and because um, they had an exercise called um, pr private in public so it's a very common theater exercise where you um, you just act out like as if you're in your bedroom and people are just watching. So I put on Elvis Costello's mystery dance off of My Aim is True. This was in 1982. And I just started like thrashing around, <laughs> pretending I was in my bedroom, just goofing off to the song and lip syncing it and stuff. And the, it brought the house down. And I, I would recently moved into that school. And then all the girls were like, at the end, they were like, oh, you're so funny. And we, we sit at our lunch table. And you should try out for the next play. And I was just like, ah. <laughs> and you know, girls had talk to me. <laughs> but, and so I, I was like, I left the other model United Nations chess team. Forget it. It was done. I was, I was in. And eventually, you know, met my wife, um, who uh, we were drama geeks at the University of Washington together and ended up dating later on and now have been together for 25 years. So you can, um, good things can happen. <laughs> You you talked you've talked about the art uh, part, and I want to get to the faith. But I, I can't not ask you about the idiocy of the title. Why did you choose to include that in the title, and what do you mean by that? Well, part of the idiocy is you know just the stupid things that I've done and the and uh, the things that I've experienced. Um, I wanted to really make myself vulnerable in the book. Um, I think that's that's the only way to do a book like this, and so. There's a lot of things I end up looking pretty stupid. You know, I've made a lot of mistakes on this road, you know, and uh, of all kinds. And that's, um, you know, it's not really an idiocy thing, but one of, the, one of the chapters is called How I Bombed on Broadway. And I think it's a, it's a very telling story at the center there because it, was I was out of acting school for a few years and I was working as an actor and I got cast in my first Broadway show. And it was at the Roundabout Theater Company on Broadway. And it was kind of an English restoration comedy, stylized comedy of manners type of thing. And um, I, uh, I sucked. I was terrible in it. I got really stuck early on in the rehearsal process. And I, and I, you know, I always have had this issue, this character defect of just wanting approval and wanting people to like me. But so I got cast and I had these thoughts of like, oh, I could get, I could get a Tony nomination and I, I could get a great New York Times review and I could get a, a great agent and I could get discovered from this. And, you know, I had all these visions of sugar plums, you know, and um, uh, I got really stuck in, in the role. I, I couldn't get out of it. I was just bad. I was very robotic and stiff and and it just ended up not being good. And I went through hell. You know, I'd call my wife at 3 in the morning and, and, and sob to her about it. And um, I just I couldn't get out of it. And, and I was, it was eating me up inside. And then when I finished that, I remember going out on 44th Street near Broadway in New York. And I was like, you know what? F it. You know, I'm not ever going to do that again. Whatever just happened. I'm not going to do it. It's just too hard. I can't be some 
external idea of what it is to be a New York actor, wanting approval, wanting to be liked, you know, thinking I needed to be something outside of myself. Whatever all of that stuff, I just really jettisoned. I was like, I'm a quirky guy, I'm, I'm an oddball, um, this is who I am, I need to play roles that are like that, I need to use who I am in those kind of roles. And, and that's when I started slowly, slowly having more and more success. And so when I look back on it, it was, it was a horrible experience. Bombing on Broadway and getting bad reviews and sucking in front of a thousand people every night for three months or four months, like, it really sucks, trust me. <laughs> and yet, had I not gone through that, I never would have played Dwight. You know, I wouldn't have had the tools, I wouldn't have had the skill set and the belief in myself to play such an odd, quirky character that draws on a lot of my own odd quirks. So I think that's how life works. You can look at it as a psychological lesson, a sociological lesson, a spiritual lesson, if you like. But those, those fires and those tests, oftentimes, when you get the luxury of looking back on your life and having written a memoir, which is something I recommend for everyone, uh, whether you're on TV or not, to write one, because it's a really interesting perspective to look back on your life and you see how it was those tests that make us who we are. Right. And, and that was not too far from the time when you started going back to your Baha'i childhood faith, yeah. right? And, and started incorporating back into your life. And, and you talk a lot about in the book and also in Soul Pancake about spirituality and how that's no longer a cool word in society. And you wanted to kind of bring that back and have people discuss the big questions in life. Why did you feel like that? Because that's different from acting, right? What, what drew you to that too in addition to the, the acting that you were doing at the time? Well, see, that's where I disagree with you a little bit. What I came to realize is it's not different than acting. Mm. So in our culture, spirituality right now is this very separate thing. It has to do with church, it has to do with fundamentalist religion, or else it has to do with some kind of very vague, new agey kind of like yoga pants and crystals and you know how I'm feeling today and my aura kind of bullshit, right? So <laughs> when spirituality really is based in truth and the truth of the human condition and um, and it's a set of skills and tools that one uses in one's life to understand how to navigate life better, but also what gives us meaning and what gives us purpose and uh, what moves us forward. So it's a, I, I view it more like that, but I also view, I used to view art, and when I was starting Soul Pancake, Ed Helms came up and was like, hey, Rain, uh, uh, uh what, uh, what's this soul pancake thing you're starting? I was like, well, it kind of blends creativity and spirituality. And he was like, well, aren't those things mutually exclusive? And I think that that's a very common misnomer. I think if you look at human history, the spiritual and the artistic has always been blended. Whether it's shamans in a cave telling a story, whether it's Michelangelo working on the Sistine Chapel, um, uh, it's John Coltrane, you know, uh, creating his work that he saw as kind of this divine prayer mm -hmm. played through his saxophone that I, it's one of the central, te I'm not, it is a key teaching in the Baha'i faith that art and devotion are synonymous, especially art done in the spirit of service. So if you're doing art in service to others, because whatever you're doing in service is really an act of worship, maybe the most powerful act of worship that you can have. So. Yeah, it, it was a long journey for me having uh, lost faith. I moved to New York City. I just wanted to be a bohemian. I didn't want uh, any morality. I, didn't want, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, and I wanted to live that bohemian lifestyle. And then as I became an actor, I found myself very dissatisfied in my life, which didn't make any sense to me because I was working as an actor. I was a professional actor. Why, why do I feel alienated and discontent inside? What's going on with this? And then I thought, well, maybe by discarding God and faith, I had thrown out the baby with the bathwater. And I, so I started a very long, it was like a eight year journey of exploring God and faith. And I read the holy books of the world and started having discussions with people and kind of digging into life's big questions in a, 
in a more vital way. And that eventually, over years, brought me back to the faith of my childhood. And I decided mm -hmm. that that made the most sense to me. And it also brought me the most focus and the most serenity. And uh, so that's, that's part of the story as well. Yeah, thanks. I, I really appreciate you explaining that. And I think the parts in the book where you talk about that aspect of spirituality were, were some of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for, for talking with me. I would love, if, if you would, if we could turn it over to the audience and, yeah. and <laughs> ask some questions. We do have microphone. Uh, we have a microphone in the back for you. So if you could please make sure to use it. Uh, and while you're lining up and uh, while we get our first question, I have uh, one last question for you, Rain. And I, we all love The Office. And how much of you is in Dwight and how much of Dwight is in you? That's what she said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I get asked that question a lot. I don't really know how to answer it. I, um, um, you know, I can certainly be a dick um, <laughs> at times. Um, uh, yeah, I'm pretty different than Dwight, I have to say. Like, real, real answer, you know, <laughs> jokey answers, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm not like Dwight at all. You know, I'm not regimented and disciplined and, and rigorous and, and with a set of hierarchical rules, and I'm not a toady, and um, I'm not, uh, I can, sometimes I can be a little self-serious, but I'm not kind of self-serious in the way that he is. Um, his whole kind of clannishness around his family and the, the shrewd system <laughs> is not at all how I am. Um, and uh, uh, his, I, I'm, I, I like to think that I'm more emotionally sensitive. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm definitely quirky and uh, uh, I, I think there's a little Dwight in all of us. That's what she said. <laughs> There we go. All right. Well, thank you. I could go to the back. Hey there. Uh, so actually tying into that, my first question is, what type of bear is best? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> I think um, I'm going to go with the uh, Himalayan sun bear, which has never been brought up on the office before <laughs> because uh, they're really the bear that's most in need of protection. Of, from us. So that was my anti-Dwight answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, then Dwight would say false black bear. False black bear. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, do you have a favorite part of the book? And if so, which is it and why? Um, do I have a favorite part of the book? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think that, you know, I've been over some of my favorite parts. I, I, you know, I think my favorite part of the book really is is towards the end when I start talking about um, Soul Pancake and the founding of that media company with my friends and also the work that my wife and I do in Haiti and some of the arts education that we do for adolescent girls in, in rural Haiti um, because it really is a culmination of so much of what I've gone through and learned through my life um, have been have resulted in these things, have resulted in Soul Pancake, which is a, a constant exploration of what it is to be a human being. Life's big questions, inspiring content, uplifting content, bringing people together. It combines the spiritual with the creative, um, and the same with the work in Haiti. Um, so that's been nice to see that the, 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 the things that I'm most engaged in in my life right now are kind of a culmination of and reflection of my life's journey to this point. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else? Right. Yep. Is that it? One question. Oh, I got one. No. <laughs> um, you've had such an incredible career with just this longevity with The Office and your books and everything. Is there something that you haven't done yet that you really want to do? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of things I, I want to do. Uh, I have a couple of movies that I'd really like to direct. Um, I haven't directed a movie. Um, I'd also really love to do a, a great kind of Broadway run and a role to kind of have that experience. I've been on Broadway a couple of times, but to go back and to have like a, a really good role and, and um, experience kind of a Broadway run 
is a is a really exciting thing to do as an actor. You know, take the subway in and go to the theater and you know the half hour call and people coming in and being in these houses that are 120 years old that Barrymore used to act in and stuff. It's a really fun uh, thing. So there's a couple things I'd like to do. And what, what's that? Well, I guess the follow up to that is like, what, what is that dream role on Broadway then? What's that? That what did you grow up with? Be like, oh my god, I would love to do that. Larry Page, the musical. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I have one over here. We'll pass it to you. Can we pass it to him? No. Hi. Um, how does it work with the writers on a show like The Office? How did you go about creating Dwight? Did, was it a written part that then you put your stamp on, or did you guys exchange ideas? How do you create that and collaborate with the writers? So the word that you use, collaborate, is really the best uh, word. I mean, there wouldn't be Dwight without the writers, and without Greg Daniels especially. I mean, he really is the, the super genius behind the whole show. but. You know, first of all, so our office was based on the BBC office, so, you know, Gareth was an amazing creation, and there's just so much stuff that I did as Dwight that just was taken from Gareth, stolen from Mackenzie Crook and, and him playing Gareth. Um, and then I uh, had conversations with Greg about what he was thinking about, um, about Dwight. He wrote a really great email early on. I, I need to find that email of um, where he did... He, I, I wrote him an email. I said, I'm worried that Dwight's just kind of going to be the annoying, geeky guy in the office. Like, what can we do to kind of change that up um, and give him more textures and layers and nuance? And he wrote this beautiful, like, essay about Dwight and how he sees the world and his hierarchies and his love of order and his family and, and stuff like that. And I have to find that essay somewhere. But, but for instance, early on in the first season, there was no hint of Dwight being on a farm or anything like that. And I did an improvisation where I said, just completely off the cuff, I was like, my name is Dwight Schrute. My father's name is Dwight Schrute. <laughs> His father's name, Dwight Schrute, <laughs> Amish. And that was all of a sudden, there was this Amish connection. And they're like, oh, that's cool. And that led to eventually the beet farm and the Amishness and Moe's and the the bed and breakfast, and so it came out of an improv. So there was a, there was a give and take. Uh, and that was one of the great things about The Office. I have a friend on a big sitcom right now, and they're not allowed to improvise at all. I mean, if you say, it says, um, uh, yeah, hello, you can't even say, um, okay, hello. You have to say it, you're doing a comedy, and you have to say every line as scripted. And The Office was very uh, collaborative, which I really uh, appreciated. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, thanks so much for coming. I saw you uh, when you were here last, five years ago. It's good to see you. Oh, nice. You. Um, so my question is, what was your experience like writing the book, taking so much time to just reflect and look back and sort of process your life? Um, and, you know, has it, has it changed? How was the experience of it? And, and has it changed at all how you, uh, you know, live now? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, um, technology is the number one enemy to trying to get anything creative done. And that maybe you guys find that. You work in technology, but I imagine like your emails and your Twitter feed are your number one enemy to try doing programming or, what, or design or whatever it is you're doing. Um, I would turn the Wi-Fi off in my computer. What I, what I really wanted to do was get a computer without any Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> so it was just like I was... But it, it was great. It was very meditative, meditative. To, I, would, I realized that my only creative hours were really between like 9 and 12.30. After that, my brain was mush. And in that period of time, I could write between um, 400 and 1,000 words. And um, that's really, uh, you know, if you do that every day, uh, if you write 1,000 words a day for, you know, 300 days, then you've got 300,000 Words? Is that right? That's too much words. See, this is why I'm not in programming. But you could write a book. You know what I mean? You can write a book. So um, it was a, a great process of uh, looking back on your life and, and, and 
it was the first time I really like made myself that disciplined to sit down every day and and put down the number of those number of words on on, on the page. So. Um, hello. Uh, so hey. since faith and and spirituality is a big part of your book, I was wondering what your personal definition of God is. That's a that's a great question because I think that that's where people get really hung up. You know, the, I, I I also joke that um, you know. It's, it's really an anathema for a comedian to talk about God or spirituality because people are just like, first of all, other, other comedians are just like, oh, oh, they don't know how to deal with it. And, it, and, it's, and it's, I love talking about topics that really clear the room, like God and death. Like you bring up, so what do you think about God? Like, uh, excuse me, I, I got to go. Uh, you know, it's, it's a really like creeps people out. I, so I was saying like recently I said on one of these book tour things, I was like, you know, the most punk rock thing that someone can do is talk about God and spirituality because it is the thing that just unsettles people more than anything else. But one of the things we tried to do at Soul Pancake was really redefine the idea of God because that's where people get really hung up. It's the God of their grandfathers or it's a judgmental old man on a cloud with a beard who's really judgmental and scowling and disapproving and you know hates people of this faith and loves people of the other. But for me, it was um, uh, when I started researching Native American spirituality, and I started, I found this concept of Wakantanka from the Lakota Sioux idea of God, and the name literally translates as the great mystery. And when I started thinking about God as the great mystery, um, sure, a creator, sure, all loving, sure, running through this material realm and the realms of of, and running through science and infinite other dimensions. But when I think about it as a great mystery, that's, and that God is essentially unknowable, that helps me a lot. So I don't, I don't know who or what God is specifically, but that was a really helpful bridge for me. Yeah. Um, you've had played a number of unique roles. I mean, I loved you on The Office, but I really also liked you on uh, Six Feet Under as well. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there is something specific that you look for when you're considering taking on a, a role. Yeah, it's um, it, it's kind of this way for all actors. It's like, do you respond to it? You know, you read the role, and does it does it just touch you or move you in some way? Does it uh, affect you? Um, and I've always part of what the book is about, and the Bassoon King is why I always play these weird outsiders, you know, and I'm really drawn to playing these weird outsider roles. I wouldn't know how to play a popular guy or a well-balanced individual, you know. I, I just, I don't, I don't connect, I don't know how to do it. Um, actually, I'd like to try sometime to just see if I could. I mean, I don't, that would be really difficult for me. So it, it is a kind of an instinct thing. Um, uh, if you feel like you could... Uh, you kind of, as you've been acting for many years, you kind of know. Maybe it's different, it's same in the tech world. If you're offered a challenge in the tech world, and you're kind of like, ooh, I like that challenge, and I know how to do that. I don't know specifically how to do it, but I know that I could do something really cool in that direction. And it's the same thing that happens as an actor. That's a great answer. <laughs> they were all great answers. They were all great answers. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, or should we call it a day? I think, I think we've got one more in the back. Okay. Irene, um, you recently just finished writing a book, obviously, so you have a little free chunk of time. Do you have a favorite TV show right now that um, is currently on? Silicon Valley. <laughs> For real, I love Silicon Valley. It really makes me laugh. It's so funny. And I just was chuckling about Hulu as I was walking through your campus. <laughs> and it's just making me laugh so much. Um, I love Game of Thrones. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff. There's a lot of great stuff going on on TV right now. Comedy, not so much. Comedy's <laughs> tough. I, I'm having a hard time finding comedies that, that actually make me laugh. I like Veep a lot, too. Um, there's a few out there, but they're, they're hard to find. Well, Rain, thank you so much for coming to Google, for yeah. talking to us about the Bassoon King. It was, it was really lovely. And uh, we are looking forward to getting to meet you and, and get signatures of the book. Awesome. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>